Hello and welcome to this video lecture on section 35.3 on the central nervous system. In this section, we hope to achieve the learning objectives of identifying the spinal cord, cerebral lobes, and other brain areas on the diagram of the brain, and describe the basic functions of the spinal cord, cerebral lobes, and other brain areas. First, we need to know that in our central nervous system, we will have two main structures. We have our spinal cord and our brain, and their job is to receive sensory information and initiate motor control, and both of them are protected by bone. We'll see that the brain is protected by the skull or the cranium, and our spinal cord is protected through vertebrae. And both of these structures will also be protected and supported by membranes known as meninges. And you could see those meningeal layers over here. We have a tough dura mater, then we have a more delicate arachnoid mater, and lastly, the most intimate, which is pia mater that is adhered right onto the brain. And we're gonna see a similar arrangement for the spinal cord as well. And sometimes these meninges can become inflamed or infected, and that is called meningitis. And they are known to be caused by bacteria or viruses. Now within the brain and around the spinal cord and around the brain as well, we are gonna have some cerebrospinal fluid. And that is really found in a layer known as our subarachnoid space, just below the arachnoid matter layer. And um, it also travels around the brain and then in certain ventricles, which we see pictured over here. And it really helps to cushion and protect our brain and spinal cord. Sometimes we need to do what's called a spinal tap, where we go just below lumbar vertebrae number two, typically around lumbar vertebrae number four though, just to make sure that we are not making any contact with the spinal cord, but we are able to do that lumbar puncture in that area to withdraw some cerebrospinal fluid for testing. Maybe we're looking to see if they have meningitis and searching for bacteria within that fluid. And like I mentioned, we find that cerebrospinal fluid in ventricles as well. So they are these spaces within the brain. Here is our lateral ventricle. We have two on each side. It's kind of C-shaped or uh, horseshoe shaped, you could say. And then they meet in the center to create a third ventricle. And then we have another canal that brings us down to the fourth ventricle. From there, there are four different openings. We don't need to know the specifics of that, but know that it does travel down what we call the central canal of the spinal cord so we can circulate the cerebrospinal fluid around the spinal cord as well. And now let's get into the different parts of the brain. We have the cerebrum, which is the main mass of the brain, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, which is also termed our little brain, and then our brainstem. We also have an, another name for cerebrum, and that is our telencephalon. And this is the largest part of our brain and it's the last center to receive sensory input and carry out integration before commanding voluntary motor responses. Basically, we're saying that we have sensory information come in. Typically, it's gonna make a stop at the thalamus in our diencephalon, and then it'll relay it into our, um, into our cerebrum. We're gonna talk more about this in the coming slides. And then we can decide, do we need to have a motor response to that? will communicate anteriorly here and that information will flow out. So it's really helping to communicate and coordinate the activities of the other parts of the brain. Let's start talking about the cerebral hemispheres first. And these are essentially divided into a right cerebral hemisphere and a left cerebral hemisphere through this division here, which we call the longitudinal fissure. Now we can also call this the sagittal fissure. And if we were to pull this area apart, we would look down on a structure known as the corpus callosum. This is a extensive bridge, and we are gonna have nerve fibers connecting the right and left hemispheres with one another and communicating. 
Now, when we look at the brain, it looks very squiggly, right? So the parts that are convoluted or sticking up here are called gyri. So if we're just talking about one of these, it's a gyrus. But if we're talking about many of them, it's a gyri. And then we have these depressions sitting in between them. So these depressions are sulci. That's the plural term. And if we're just talking about one of these depressions, it is a sulcus. And so I kind of think of this as peaks and valleys. So let me see if my marker is going to work here. Yeah, like this. So that the parts that are sticking up here are going to be gyri, and the parts that are depressed are called uh, sulci. So this is our mountain, let's say, and this is a valley. And now for our lobes of the cerebrum, we have our frontal lobe here. This is the most anterior. And in this region, we'll have higher cognitive functions like us uh, thinking, planning, problem solving. And we have our short-term memory storage here too. And we can also control movement here. We're going to talk about some motor areas. Um, it's the area that is responsible for your personality and emotions. Next, we have your parietal lobe, which is just posterior or behind the frontal lobe here. And this is involved in attention, language, and what we will focus on is more of that sensory information. So touch, temperature, and pain. And we're also going to be able to have some visuospatial processing, such as our skills within math, spelling, and our hand-eye coordination. If we continue posteriorly, we see the occipital lobe, and this is going to be our area where we process visual information. And this will also involve recognizing shapes and colors. And lastly, here we have our temporal lobe that is going to be found inferior to our frontal lobe and parietal lobes. And this is going to be where we process that sensory information of smell, taste, and sound. And we'll also see that there are specific areas that play a role in language, reading, and our memory storage. Deep to this area, we are going to have that hippocampus. And we uh, don't see this on the slide, but if we were to open up this area, we would actually see a fifth lobe known as the insula, which means little island that is more for primitive types of functioning. All right, let's move on. If we were to slice the brain, you would see that we have these two different colors here, right? The white matter and the gray matter. And so the gray matter here is what we call the cerebral cortex. It's highly convoluted and it's going to be responsible for all of our conscious thought as well as sensation or voluntary movement our thought process, um, and we're going to elaborate a little bit more on this in the coming slides. All right, so here it is. When we look at this area here, this is our primary motor area or primary motor cortex, and we could see that it is a part of the frontal lobe, but it's in front or anterior to an area that we call the central sulcus. So the central sulcus is this depression that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, or we could say it separates the motor cortex from what we call the somatosensory cortex. So essentially the sensory part of our brain. So let's go back to our motor cortex to talk about that in detail. This is going to involve our voluntary signals to our skeletal muscles. So if you are reaching for a coffee cup to drink it right now, those are voluntary signals you're sending to your muscles in order to be able to do that. And then we have muscles that control our facial movements and things like swallowing, salivation, expression that are going to take up a large portion of this motor area. So if you look at this right over here, this is known as a homunculus. And this is a figure from your text. And it shows you these little spacings to give you an idea of how large that motor map is 
on our motor cortex. So notice that one of the largest ones are our hands and our fingers, because this is going to be where we have that fine motor movement that we're gonna need in order to be doing things like writing or sewing, crocheting, things like that. Um, and then if we were to lack oxygen during birth, it can damage the motor areas, and that can result in something known as cerebral palsy, where we have a weakness of the arms and the legs. Next, let's talk about an area known as the basal nuclei. And a lot of people think it's just one structure, but it's actually a makeup of several different structures. And it used to be called basal ganglia, but ganglia refers to a collection of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. And if we look at the basal nuclei, you can see some of the structures highlighted here in the pink and red. These are cell bodies within the brain. And whenever we have a collection of cell bodies in the brain, we call it a nuclei. Not to be confused with the nucleus of a cell, this is gonna be different. We're talking about the cell bodies of our neurons in one location. So like we see here, it's the collection of those cell bodies in gray matter that we find deep within this white matter area. And basically all of these structures are going to work together to, to integrate motor commands to make sure that we can have the proper muscle group stimulated or inhibited depending on the movement we're trying to do and also make it coordinated so that it's nice and smooth. In people that have Parkinson's disease, we are gonna see that they have a degeneration of specific neurons within the basal nuclei, specifically in an area known as the substantia nigra. So here you could see somebody who does not have Parkinson's disease where this area has the dark pigmentation that represents our neurons that are going to be able to um, produce dopamine. And here we see that that is diminished in someone that has Parkinson's. And here are some typical appearance or signs and symptoms of somebody that has Parkinson's disease. They have a stooped posture, a masked facial expression, they have a forward tilt of their trunk, they have rigidity within their back. We tend to see their elbows and their wrists are flexed and they have reduced arm swinging. They may even have a tremor within their hands. Next, let's move into an area known as the diencephalon. This is going to include what we call the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and our epithalamus, which is made up of our pineal gland or pineal body and the havinular nucleus. So starting off with our hypothalamus, it's this triangular area right in here, and it is known as our integrating center. It's gonna regulate our hunger, sleep, thirst, body temperature, and water balance. It does a slew of other things too. I really call it like the parent of the brain because it is also going to look after and take care of the pituitary gland because it's gonna create some releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones to essentially tell the pituitary gland what to do. So it really is going to serve a link between our nervous and endocrine systems. Our thalamus is found kind of right in the center of the brain. So the hypothalamus was down here, that triangular area, and the thalamus is here. And I always picture it if you're Thinking of the thalamus on both sides of the brain, it actually kind of looks like an egg on each side, and I'm kind of drawing these spaced apart, and there is a connection in the middle. So what you're looking at here, do you see that spot right there? It's basically like we sliced the brain in half, so you're seeing that connection, and then the thalamus is surrounding that area. And so this area is very important in receiving sensory input, except for the sense of smell, meaning that any type of sensation that you're gonna have, whether it's a touch of pressure, a temperature change, vision, all of it is going to make a pit stop first at the thalamus and then be directed to the proper area. If it's eyesight, we're gonna direct that eventually over to the occipital lobe, for example. So I like to call this as our sensory relay station, SRS. 
sensory relay station. It relays those sensations to the correct areas. And then as a part of our epithalamus, we have our pineal gland. And this is very important because it secretes a hormone known as melatonin, which is gonna help regulate our daily rhythms. We do see a higher secretion of melatonin at night, which makes us sleepy. Moving into the limbic system, this is going to help regulate our emotions with higher mental functions such as reasoning and memory. So it's going to include the area of the amygdala, and you could see that right down in this region here as well as the hippocampus. I mentioned that in relation to our temporal lobe, this is gonna be crucial for our learning and memory, especially our long-term memories. And then we have the cingulate gyrus. And remember that gyrus is that convoluted portion over on the cerebrum, and this is gonna help us with our emotions and pain. And then for the cerebellum, this is our little brain that we're going to find in the back of the brain, just underneath the occipital lobe, and it's separated by the brain stem by the fourth ventricle. So if you look at this image over here, our brain stem is anterior and the cerebellum is posterior. So that space that almost looks like a triangle when it's sliced in half, because in actuality it's more of like a diamond shape, is going to be our fourth ventricle. Now when we look at the cerebellum, we also see that it's made up primarily here of white matter and it extends out. And at the end of these, we'll see some gray matter that almost creates almost like a, like a tree-like effect. So this area of the white matter is known as arbor vitae, which translates to the tree of life. And our cerebellum's main role is to maintain our posture and balance. And it's going to work along with the basal nuclei to help smooth and coordinate our voluntary movements. On to our brainstem and then we're going to get into the spinal cord. So our brainstem is made up of three different parts. We have our midbrain, the pons, and our medulla oblongata, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So starting off with our midbrain, this is a relay station as well, but it's really helping communication between our cerebrum up here and our spinal cord or the cerebellum. So that's why it's so close in proximity to all of those. And we have our reflex centers in here associated with our visual, auditory, and tactile mechanisms. Below that, we have the pons, and this helps with communication between the cerebellum and the rest of our central nervous system, so the cerebrum and the spinal cord once again. And along with the medulla oblongata below it, they're gonna assist to regulate breathing in our respiratory centers. We have reflex centers in the pons as well that helps us coordinate our head movements in response to visual and auditory stimuli. So I want you to think of you standing in one of the streets in Chicago and you hear a siren. Your head is automatically gonna move to the side that you hear that siren on, right? So that's kind of coordinating that visual and auditory type of stimuli. So lastly, we have our medulla oblongata here in our brainstem, and this too contains reflex centers, but this time it's more for regulating our heart, specifically our heartbeat or heart rate, and our vasoconstriction um, assisting in regulating our blood pressure. And we talked about how it works together with the pons for breathing. We'll also have our reflex centers for vomiting, coughing, sneezing, hiccuping, and swallowing. And above the spinal cord, we're going to see that there are some tracks that are going to ascend, meaning moving up, or descend between our spinal cord and these higher brain centers. So we don't see it visually in this image, but they are going to move just, uh, imagine axons sending information up, and sending information down. All right, and just a little quick review on gray matter and white matter. Remember that the gray matter in our brain is found on the periphery, so more on the outside, whereas the white matter is mostly found internally. We're gonna see that the opposite will be true in our spinal cord. Um, and 
it, it'll be set up the same though, so that our gray matter is going to contain the cell bodies and short non-myelinated axons, whereas our white matter, it appears white because of the myelin sheaths on our myelinated axons that run together in bundles that are called tracks. So let's go ahead and take a look at an image of a spinal cord. This is a cross section of our spinal cord, and we could see that the gray matter now is found more internally, whereas the white matter is found externally. And this is it situated with our vertebrae surrounding it. So this is anterior, where we see a body of a vertebrae, and this is posterior. Here would be our spinous process. So if you feel the center of your back and you feel those bumps going down, that is your spinous process. So in the center here, we have um, a hole that is called your vertebral foramen and that is where the spinal cord kind of sits within and we could see that gray matter on the inside and the white matter on the outside and our nerves kind of coursing out. So our spinal cord is going to extend from the base of the brain right after the medulla oblongata and it moves through an opening of the skull known as foramen magnum. Anytime you see that word foramen, it means hole, and magnum just means large. So the large hole allows that spinal cord to descend through the vertebral canal. So at each vertebral level, we have that vertebral foramen, the hole in the vertebrae, and the entire stacking of those vertebral foramen create the vertebral canal for that spinal cord to move all the way down. Now notice that our spinal cord stops short even though the vertebral canal continues to go down to um, actually our sacral area. So it is gonna stop at the level of L2, um, and that is why, if you remember back to our spinal tap or lumbar puncture, we typically go right in between L3 and L4 to do that because that way we are not going to run into the spinal cord. And our spinal nerves are going to project from our spinal cord through small openings known as the intervertebral foramina. So notice how these vertebrae, when they're stacked on top of each other, we have these holes that get created on the side and that's what we're referring to as the inter meaning between the uh, vertebral meaning the vertebrae so that's a hole between the two vertebrae so that's where those spinal nerves are going to come out from you could see this depicted really well over here and then sitting in between each of our uh, vertebral bodies we're going to have this disc this is known as our intervertebral disc and we do have two different parts I'm not going to hold you responsible for this uh, right now but we have our annulus fibrosis on the outside and a um, nucleus pulposus on the inside and sometimes these can herniate and pinch those nerves all right, let's talk about the nerves or neural structures that exit the spinal cord. So we've got our gray matter here and the white matter that make up the spinal cord. Beyond that, if we look posteriorly, we're gonna have these little axons extending out and we're gonna call these dorsal rootlets that come together and create a dorsal root. And it's important to know that we're only going to find sensory neurons in here and information is flowing in remember sensory information always flows in motor information always flows out and so it is the vertebral um sorry not vertebral ventral rootlets and ventral root that are going to contain only motor neurons so essentially sensory information goes in through the dorsal root they communicate here in the spinal cord with a motor neuron and that motor neuron exits out to the ventral root. Now notice how both the dorsal root and the ventral root join together here and form a mixed spinal nerve. We call it mixed because we have both sensory and motor neurons within there. And so now because we have exited the spinal cord, this spinal nerve is a part of our peripheral nervous system. And I had mentioned how 
in the brainstem, we're going to have some ascending and descending tracks. We also have ascending and descending tracks in the spinal cord, and they are going to be found in the white matter. So you could see ascending tracks moving up in this direction, descending tracks moving down. And I wanted to show you this connection here. This is our spinal cord. You could see some tracks moving up and down, but notice in this area, which represents the brainstem, we do have some of those fibers crossing over to the the opposite side. So you may have heard that, oh, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. It's be primarily because of these tracks moving to the opposite sides.